This talk I'm going to, to hold now is about the past and the future of the Appifier project. And um, yeah, I um, took some data and uh, I yeah, kind of counted um, things like commits and made some statistics. And so I would like to, to present you the results. Um, and I think that we can discuss some of these uh, things and maybe we can um, yeah, have a look into the future and see where we are heading and um, yeah, whether the entire project is heading. If we start right at the beginning, the project started in 2005 and um, this November that would be the seventh, uh, seventh year of the Appifier 2 release that we are currently calling the, the stable version. Um, since then, since the 8th of November 2007, we published 82 core updates and we made 8 major versions. Um, those are the versions uh, called IPFI 2.1, 2.3 and so on. So we call these major versions because we made huge steps and we introduced a huge, uh, huge number more, uh, of more features. Um, yeah, and because of all this hard work, we have become one um, of the most uh, used firewall distributions out there. We um, are pretty stable, I think. Um, people use it in all sorts of environment. And um, we also have blue, uh, bleeding edge features. So um, it's interesting for many numbers, uh, yeah, for, for a huge number of people um, in the world. There are many people are using Appifier without even knowing that. Um, for example, there are some universities using Appifier, so all the students access the internet through the Appifier installation that's, that's running there. And um, that could be easily a thousand or two thousand students, and it uh, scales up to a re really huge number of users, and it also scales down to only one user, for example, the home user. Some people use it at home in the home office or in small offices. And we can do all this with, uh, with um, exactly one code base. We don't have versions for bigger installations or a version for smaller ones. We just have one version of the code and it's scaling from very small environments to very huge environments. That's part, uh, partly because it's just not a router or not a firewall. It's much more versatile. We have add-ons. We have uh, many features that are built in and so you can use it for, for many, many things, not just the plain root of firewall functionality. And of course, it's easy to manage and uh, very robust. The best feature about it, it's open source software. It's free for everybody to use. There's no, no strings attached. Um, you can just download it, install it and use it. So that was the introductionary bit. Um, from now on, I'm considering the data that I talked um, earlier on about. Um, as far as I don't state it otherwise, I counted the um, commits in the main repository, that's our master branch, um, over the last two years. So I thought the last two years would be uh, a, a good amount of, of time um, yeah, to, to review and to, to see what we have done. Um, because there have been very many uh, exciting things um, since there and things that were further back, I, I thought most of them don't matter anymore. In the past two years, we made two major releases and 20 core updates. That was, um, just for reference, it was um, IPFire 2.11 core update 62 to IPFire 2.15 core update 82, which has been released a week ago. We average about, in average, we uh, release an update every five weeks. We used to, to release it a bit more often, but um, yeah, we we might get to this topic a little bit uh, later. But well, we struggle a bit with testing, and that's one of the the main problems that we can can see from the data, um, because we are getting slower and slower and slower with every release because we are lacking some some testing feedback and. Uh, things like that. But let's first focus on uh, the plain numbers of updates. We um, yeah, do updates for all sorts of reasons. Um, most of them come with minor new features. That's something we do with almost every release. We add some smaller features and some just are uh, security updates, for example. And of those, we had four major security ones. Um, one has been in the kernel, one has been in the strong swan package, two in OpenSSL. Um, none of that was uh, the heartbeat bug. 
hard bleed bug. Um, and then we had three minor security issues which were in Apache Strongs one again and OpenVPN. Not too bad I think. We are usually very quick when we release security updates. We uh, pushed out the last one which was one of the uh, two OpenSSL issues uh, in less than 24 hours after uh, the, the fix has been published. So. Um, and another interesting thing I would like to point out is that most people um, are running on a very recent release, which is not really that common right now. Um, but we have a pretty much um, easy to use um, packet manager, so if there is a release, a new release, it's just one click to, to install it, reboot the system maybe, and then you're uh, safe again. For example, if you have the uh, if you have uh, released a security update. So um, this data, especially the last bit where I say that we um, have um, the most users on a recent release is from the Fire Info system. We just co collect hardware profiles and um, yeah, some very limited um, amount of um, data that is related to the software, which is the, the release, I, I believe, and the, the software bits. And apart from that, we are um, profiling the, the uh, hardware data so that we know what kind of hardware our users are using and that we can optimize for that. All this data is not sent to us by default. You have to enable it because we don't want to be evil. And um, yeah, we are not really sure how many people uh, enabled that. So um, for, yeah, to make things simple in this talk, um, I just assume that the data that we have is a rep representative for all users. We can't really show about that because maybe home users tend to enable it uh, more frequently than like the corporate users because they have to protect their corporate data or something like that. I'm not really sure what those people are thinking um, or if there is a pattern like, like this. Um, but yeah, just to make it simple, I assume that this data is representative. We um, also record from where the um, the um, data um, is sent from. So if you're you're running a um, an installation of IP Fire in Great Britain, for example, we um, track the the geo IP information and then we save um, the name of the country where you're from and therefore we can uh, say that IPFI is running in at least 175 countries in the world. I didn't even know that there, uh, there were so many countries that exist. Um, IPFI is most popular in Europe, um, maybe because we have a very very huge um, yeah, uh, support forum and mainly all the developers are based in Europe. There are other firewalls which um, are more um, common in, in America for example, well, we are most popular in Europe. So the exact data just to make um, yeah, to make this very clear because we have some, some interesting things that we can, can see here. 48% um, of the systems are running in Germany. So that means we are most popular um, yeah, in uh, in, in Germany with like prob probably half of uh, all the installations. Um, the second one is United States uh, with only 8% and after that it goes down very quickly. 5%, another 5% Austria, which is quite surprising if you consider the, the size of Austria compared to the United States and, and so on. The same with uh, Switzerland, which is also at 4%, 3% France, 3% Italy, 2% Russia, 2% Indonesia, which is also surprising, 1.6% Canada, 1.6% Great Britain, 1.4% South Africa, Australia as well, 1.3% Poland and 1.3% Brazil. So you can see um, it just goes down very, very quickly right here. And everything after that is less than 1%. Yeah, this is where the speculation starts a little bit. Um, it is a bit surprising that Switzerland, for example, has so many users and, for example, um, yeah, France doesn't, although France has more uh, people there. Uh, France has a, a, a bigger po population. So um, yeah, we kind of assume that um, this may be partly because of the, the German support forum. Um, 
yeah, Austria and Switzerland are countries um, in which German is spoken. We also think that um, especially the people in, in Switzerland are very aware of these security issues. Although it's very interesting because those, were, uh, those are pretty small countries and if you think well that the, the usage must be kind of related to the population then you might wonder where is China and India and those are only at 0.4% and 0.68% uh, so literally nothing nobody is using uh, our software in in there so yeah what are the explanations I already said that we have a German support forum the other language that is um, most commonly used in, on our forums is English and um, for example China and India those people um, yeah, are not used to, to speak English. Then we have some good coverage in uh, some yeah, also German IT magazines which is uh, CT, Linux magazine and Linux user where we have also published articles that we wrote ourselves um, and we have worked with some of the editors who wrote articles about Appify and we kind of reviewed them. The other point I already mentioned it is that some nationalities are, seem to be more security aware and you can call it maybe paranoid. Um, well, yeah, there, there seems to be a little bit of a difference. So that was the, the user statistics. Um, it's not very much, but it's always interesting to look into that. Um, yeah, if you're interested more in this, there's fireinfo.ipfire.org. The development statistics are as follows. Um, these are considering again the last two years where we had 2801 commits in the main repository. That's our the master branch. Um, this is just the, the code that we released is in the master branch. The code that we are currently working on is in the next branch and there are some other branches for, for different features. Like if we're working on something that's um, on the wish list, we usually develop in, uh, it in, in an extra branch where we do all the changes and if we decide that it is stable enough, we pull it into the next branch and prepare it for release. Everything that is currently in, under development or is ongoing uh, um, is not considered here, but may the most or the, the biggest chunk of the already released code is um, in the, the master release or is counted here. So that makes 27 code contributors, which is a pretty decent number. I'm very happy about that people um, contribute code and other stuff to, to our project. Um, these are the names of those people. Um, okay, right ahead. Um, there are some, some people which are called the, the code developers who obviously contribute, contribute the most part um, of the code, which there's, yeah, like me, then there's, there, there's Arnie. Um, Alexander Marx, he wrote the new firewall GUI that we released um, about uh, half a year ago, yeah, now, yeah. And that was a very huge amount of work um, that he did and so he's, um, yeah, he's contributed 564 commits, which is well, almost a quarter of um, the, the changes and a little bit less. The next group of people who contribute are those who yeah, contribute on a regular basis, um, starting with Stefan, who is actually a core developer, but he's more working on IP Fire 3 and not on IP Fire 2, and so this is not counted in, in these statistics. Then there is um, yeah, Alf, I'm not really sure how we pronounce the, his last name, Hogemark or Hogemark, I'm not really sure. He's from Norway, I think. Yeah, then there's Eric with like 50 commits and it, it goes all the way down to like 12 commits. Um, and after that we have the group of, um, I call them one-time contributors, although they have, for example, like three commits over here, um, but they just send you some something that they would like to, to see fixed. Um, and after that they, they disappear very quickly. So yeah, that makes three core developers, eight community developers and 15 one-time contributors. I was a bit surprised that it is actually that, um, yeah, that many um, contributors. I didn't really, it didn't really feel like it sometimes. Yeah, now we are advancing um, to another part, which is the funding. Um, it's a bit difficult to talk about this because um, we are always 
kind of begging for for donations in in like everything that we put out every release message comes with the last sentence where it says please donate to to keep this project running because donations is the only thing that currently funds um, the project there's yeah donations um, not just in terms of money considered here um, but we also consider patches that are contributed in some some sort of way it's probably not really right to to call them donations but contributions uh, well that's what we what do we want? We want people to contribute either by um, enhancing the functionality of the firewall, so everyone will benefit from that, but some people can't do that, or pe some people don't want to do that, but um, the easiest way is just to fund some, some uh, features, th features that you want to see in um, the distribution, and the, yeah, you do that with money. Apart from that, um, there are many people working uh, voluntarily on the project in their free time, um, maybe um, at work if there is some, some spare time to, to fix some, some features that they are actually using. So that's the entire thing that the project is um, yeah, based on. I tried to, to yeah, do some statistics, but that's a bit hard to do because um, yeah, not all contributions are um, money so I can't just sum things up and say this one has contributed the most but um, in terms of company funding there are two groups like companies and then other people who um, donate money to us um, there are only a few the, the major ones are of course Lightning Wire Labs and TX Team which um, sell hardware appliances and a certain amount of the money that um, of that is put into the project to to keep it running and to work on driver and uh, drivers and th uh, stuff like that so that the the distribution is actually running very well on those appliances um, unfortunately we don't have many development work to do there so um, most of the the money that we make is from selling hardware appliances and support services but we don't have many customers who require us to develop uh, thing, uh, things which would be great if there would be some more. Other companies don't really tend to to send us any money which is a bit sad. I try to to separate it, them again into two groups um, there are some um, who um, add another five percent on the the invoices uh, they send to their customers and they donate that extra amount so they are they're also um, um, talking about this uh, to um, yeah to their customers, and they say this is an open source project. We, d we downloaded it for free, and um, we're just using it. So let's please give something back. Um, unfortunately, there's just two of them who make it uh, like this or do it like this, and we just get like two um, or three donations of them per year. So. That's not, not really much. On the other hand, if companies support us, then they do it mostly um, on the wish list. So if there's a certain feature that they want or need, companies usually fund the most, the, the biggest part of, of these features. Um, it seems like they, they have a lot of money sometimes to give because there's always one contributor who um, gives a yeah, major chunk. I, I don't have the data uh, right now, but it's you, sometimes a third or even a half is just um, funded by, by one company. So, um, yeah, and companies who use IPFire and do nothing more, uh, who don't sell it actually, um, they don't really seem to, to de donate very much, unfortunately. So, um, Home users, on the other hand, they donate much more often, but of course smaller amounts. Well, home users donate like 5 euros, and companies um, donate 20 or 50 euros, for example. Um, so, um, we're happy for every donation. Um, I sometimes um, say if every user um, would send us only 1 euro in a month, then we wouldn't have any trouble at all funding and working full-time on, on this project. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, but nevertheless, um, every small donation helps. So um, yeah, I'm happy about receiving these. 
from yeah, either home users or company uh, companies. The interesting thing about this is that we um, think that most of the IP5 installations are running inside of companies. We think that's about two thirds of the um, installations that are out there and there's only one third that is um, operated by, by home users or running in, in, uh, in homes. Um, but the donations don't suggest that it's actually the other way around. Home users um, donate a little bit more. If we look back um, two years ago, for example, um, the developers who worked on the project um, funded the project with their own money. We had to pay for, for various things that I am going to list um, in a minute. Um, and we don't have to do this anymore. We are getting enough money from mainly from the wish list, for example, for, for the hosting part. Um, and so, yeah, that's pretty good, I think. The basic expenses um, that we had have to um, yeah, pay money for is hosting which is um, not at all easy if you're running an entire distribution. But we could do so much more if we had more money. Oh, there's the, the sense. If every Appify user would give us one euro per month, we don't need to worry about funding at all. I'm going to list some, some things that, that we could do with, um, with more money because um, there are so many invisible work that we are doing here. Um, the main thing is maintaining the distribution. So if, if you build the distribution or if you develop a certain feature, you have to maintain it for a long time. There are bug fixes to do, there are security fixes to do. Um, you have to um, add some, some minor, minor features. Um, yeah, just because the world, world moves on, there are, for example, more, more ciphers or whatever. Small, small things that we have to add um, on a regular basis. And this work is almost invisible. Where we do it very silently it's not nothing that we can advertise very much because nobody really cares people just expect that those things work and uh, if we do an open ssl update for example um, we don't have to de develop the fix that's what the open ssl team is doing but we have to to download um, the fix we have to apply it we have to build it and we have to test it and all these things that cost a huge amount of time and yeah time is a bit tied to money. Um, so we would be happy to receive more donations, even small donations that help us to maintain uh, the distribution, just that, so that we can, can work on the little things and that we can fix every single bug and that we don't need to say no because we don't have the time to, to fix some minor, really annoying thing. That would be great. Next thing is hosting. We're currently hosting or running on two huge machines. One of um, this is um, partly yeah, donated or sponsored. We have rec space, but the hardware is ours. So we use donations to buy the hardware and we upgraded the hardware, for example, uh, from, from the donations. Um, and happily, the, the rec space is, is paid for, which is the, the most expensive part. Um, the other machine is just, just rented um, and we pay a monthly fee. So if we yeah, grow um, in the same pace as we do now, we need to expand that and for that we, of course, need a little bit more, more money. Other things that we um, could afford if we had more money are development hardware, build machines, so that's um, simply hardware because building the distribution takes five hours on the Intel architectures and up to an entire day of 24 hours on the, the ARM hardware. Depends a bit if you have some um, yeah, proper build hardware. Um, it goes really fast. We can use some caching and things like that. But in the end, the faster the hardware, the, the faster the build. The other things that are on this list, I'm not really sure if it's complete. There are so many things I, that should be on, the, on this as well. Well, most of them um, are not things that we necessarily do, uh, do need money for. But unfortunately, we don't have a huge number of contributors uh, for the documentation, for example. And therefore, yeah, we kind of feel that we are go coming to, to a point where we need to, take, uh, to, yeah, to use money and pay people to do some things for us. 
just because we are running out of time and running out of resources. Those people could probably yeah, write some documentation. Um, we could use a community manager because um, we sometimes see people um, yeah, one, wondering, um, wondering about the forums and they don't really know where to go with their problems. And if there was a person they could talk to and um, yeah, who can establish the right connections, for example, if there's a developer who wants to join the team, then yeah, that, that would, be, would be great if we had some resources. Other things is like uh, the summit. Um, our web appearance is a bit outdated, um, especially the forum and the wiki software are not maintained anymore and we need to replace them by anything or something else. And um, yeah, that's a bit hard to do because it just takes very much time and we don't have the time uh, right now. Other things are maintaining and enhancing the project infrastructure. There is an account system that we could need because uh, we have to fulfill some legal requirements if someone is contributing uh, um, code and other things. Um, so an account system would help with that so that they can, can uh, accept a license and other things. Um, we would like to get more st statistics out of fire info j just because we don't do so much uh, uh, with it right now. We collect the data, we put it into a huge database and that's it. We don't, we just count some things like the countries for example, um, but we could do a little bit more. We can um, figure out which hardware is the most common one and uh, things like that so we can um, yeah, do, do our work. A little bit better if we have more um, information about what we're actually doing here. Um, I would like to see the, the project a bit more represented on um, fairs and exhibitions. There is um, lots of smaller events uh, for example that we can go to and that we, where we can present the project because I think um, a firewall project is always a very niche project and if we can get out there and reach more people that would be great um, yeah that's basically also the next point make people aware of the project and increase the number of users because the bigger the project usually the better it gets there are more people um, who hold stakes in here an easy example is translations for that you need a huge number of users in in all parts of the world because nobody is able to, to speak all the languages um, yeah Increasing the number of users would also hopefully increase the number of developers and translators. For parts of these things, we um, invented the crowdfunding um, thing, which is called the IPFI wishlist, where we collect money for some exciting features. Um, one of the most popular ones was Tor, the, the um, Onion router, um, but, uh, which we released like about a year ago, I think. Well, it was probably about a year ago. Yeah, if you take this as an example, um, it kind of went through the roof. Um, people donated a huge amount of money um, within only a couple of days, days which was very, very cool. Um, the other big one was um, the Microsoft Active Directory proxy, uh, proxy authentication thing, which um, was released yeah, last week. Um, and I picked those two as an example because they were also very different from each other. The Tor thing was more interesting for, for home users and for hackers to play with it a little bit. And so we received um, contributions from, for that from, um, from those um, users. And the other one was almost completely uh, funded by, by companies because it's yeah, pretty much a corporate feature. The crowdfunding thing does not work for funding the essentials like maintaining the distribution. That doesn't yeah, make much sense. People just require um, certain things and therefore we can't put uh, things like the next core update on it or something. Or hardware support for better Wi-Fi support, whatever. Those things um, wouldn't, wouldn't really work. Um, but on the other hand, these two, for example, did work, work very well. To get to the feature highlights, which are partly fun, or which have been partly funded by the wish list, um, there have been very many interesting things um, 
I personally, I think that many of these uh, have been very interesting in the past um, two years. And m a couple of them have been under the hood. So you couldn't see them, you could just feel the change, I think. Um, but unfortunately, not all people appreciate it um, very much. Um, for example, GR Security is a, a patch that we apply to, to our kernel, which hardens the, the system. It works completely invisible. It just protects you from basic attack vectors like uh, buffer overflows and things like that. So ma ma many or maybe most um, bugs in the software are already catched by the GR Security framework. And as a firewall system, this is very important because every software has bugs. We just have to admit, admit, admit that and to accept that. And GR security works proactively. So um, if there is not a patch, it is still able to detect some of, uh, yeah, some sort of undefined behavior, malicious behavior, maybe. Yeah. Well, you you know how you know, how your programs need to behave, and if. For example, the SSH server is trying to um, format or maybe uh, to access uh, some device nodes and format the, the hard drive, you know, there's certainly something wrong here. And GR security is able to, to um, protect us against that. Yeah, completely invisible, but still one of the best features. Um, in fact, IPFI is the only distribution I know of which comes enabled with GR security by default, even on ARM, which, um, yeah is pretty unique. The other distribution I know which is uh, using GR security is Gen2 hardened, but is not very popular anymore. Actually, even Gen2, the, the default version is not very popular. And yeah, they're, they're working on, on this stuff um, yeah, very actively, I think, but they never managed to, to make it the default, unfortunately. The next feature is buffer bloat. Um, I'm sure you all have seen this, this graph which I just took from uh, the planet where I published the first be test benchmarks. Um, and I, I don't really want to go into much detail of all the features I'm going to mention, but basically this makes your internet connection much, much faster, even if it's com uh, completely saturated by uploads and maybe even downloads. So if you're using IPFI, your internet is actually faster. Just a plain thing. Another feature that is enabled by default and that's working in the background, you wouldn't notice unless you uh, have a, um, a too small connection for the things that you would like to do. So, for example, if you own a 2 megabit DSA connection and upload YouTube videos and try to make a voice over IP call at the same time, you wouldn't be able to do that with the, with the default router. And Bufferbloat is able to detect what kind of um, traffic saturates the link and it throttles it down a little bit so that um, there's always a good latency for uh, the retype services. Next thing um, is the new firewall GUI which yeah, has been um, developed for over a year now and we introduced many many new features that you know, were missing from, from the old one. It's very much advanced and yeah, we are very happy that we um, worked on features like uh, the firewall groups where you can um, make host groups and just use one rule to um, create rules for, for this host group. So um, even if you have a complex rule set, even if you have, have a big company, it's very easy to maintain a huge firewall rule set just because we are able to collapse the rules into very small ones and yeah, make, make good policies about that. So I'm very happy with, with that feature, for example. Then, um, because of um, some things that have changed in the world, we improved um, the cryptography in IPFire on, on many levels. Um, for example, we increased the default RSA key sizes um, at almost every places. For example, the, the VPN key sizes have been increased for IPsec and OpenVPN. And um, even the, the, the web configuration uh, interface um, is um, secure with a 4096 byte um, bit long um, key. We um, added elliptic curves for IPsec VPNs um, and the NIST and the brain pool curves so that uh, you are not um, 
relying on the, the Diffie-Hellman algorithm anymore. We added some alternative uh, ciphers for OpenVPN uh, and um, IPsec, which is um, the, the Camellia cipher, for example, that has been developed by uh, a Japanese um, your state authority. Um, you never know who you can trust or who you can't trust today. We increased the amount of entropy that the system is able to use, which is very important for all sorts of cryptographic tasks where you need some very good random random numbers. And um, so, if the systems that you uh, the system that you're using uh, is able to provide you with uh, random numbers, then we um, use that random number generator and put the um, generated entropy into the system's entropy pool, mix it f um, together from all the sources and therefore we have always plenty and good entropy. Then there's DNSSEC, which has been released very recently. Um, it's also enabled by default and um, yeah, it protects your DNS record. Or it protects you from DNS spoofing attacks, basically. Then we do have ARM versions of IPFire. Um, although only 3% of all IP5 machines are running on, on ARM. It, I think today it's more of a toy project because we are still lacking a proper system that can be used uh, with the ARM hardware. Most people use the Raspberry Pi, which is basically too weak, way too weak. It comes with only one NIC usually um, that is connected to the system via uh, USB. Is usually not usable um, at all, but many people do do it. Some uh, in production environments, some just to play around, and so we learned our lessons from that. Um, but we are probably not adding much uh, support for um, new ARM hardware coming up until we have a certain standard that we can can work on. Because the the ARM port is some part of the project that uh, takes a huge amount of time with yeah, only a small outcome, I think. Then there is DDNS, DDNS the new dynamic uh, DNS um, updater tool. Um, we, yeah, we used to use the set ddns.pl script, which um, yeah, came with a fork of IPCOP, and that one kind of grew, and it's, it had very much code uh, duplication and various problems. So we couldn't maintain it anymore. And since dindns.org uh, uh, is charging their, their customers for um, even a single record, which was free before, um, many, many new providers have been uh, created by hobbyists mainly. And adding all these into the old one wasn't even um, feasible. So we um, decided to rewrite it and this is also uh, something that we um, benefit from in, in IP5.3. Actually it was planned to um, release this one with uh, IP5.3 but we backported it uh, um, because there was the need to do it right now. I've collected some other small but for me still important features that that we did in the in the last two years. For example, we do have less installation images, which um, makes it a bit easier to, to download the right, the right one, but which also um, makes it a bit easier to host all the releases on our main server, which is running out of disk, uh, disk space a little bit. Then we Im implemented wireless on red, where you can connect your IPFI router to another wireless network. Uh, we have the DNS forwarding GUI. We have Tor that I mentioned earlier. Um, we are able to use 5 GHz um, channels um, with the wireless access point features and we can do radar detection on it so that we can uh, use all the channels if um, the hardware supports it. Um, we have open VPN per client configuration which is pretty neat and kind of tied with a new firewall GUI. We have a new, new user interface dial, we have support for LTE and 3G modems, um, there's a, a new status page where you can see the, the, the link signal quality and yeah we improved the speed of Clomar file, squid Clomar file, AV. So yeah these are just a couple of, of features um, that I picked rather randomly because I, I find them interesting or I find them important. Um, these are usually not the one the ones that our users find most important and most interesting. Maybe we can someday figure out how to um, get 
out the message for, for example, why GL security or something else is, is very important. That would be great. So, questions. This is the end almost. So, the one question. Um, at first, you talk about the problems of the project. You, uh, mm. we're, what are, you, you talked about we have very few testers. Mm. And um, do, did, did you have an idea or anything about it where which we can connect to many other people which would like to interest in testing some new things? The thing is, I don't really know why why do why we do get yeah like n no support from these people. Um, it's it always sounds a bit weird to to get support from them at the beginning to to fund um, for example some development and then in the end we say okay we did this please test it and we kind of it sounds a bit a little bit like we are dumping our work on them that might be an issue um, I think the the problem might be that those people don't really know what what we want from them that we kind of not that we are not able to get the message out there that might be a, might be a bit a little bit of a problem um, so if you're asking what we can do to to improve the situation i think we can simply try to to make the message a bit more clear that we come to a, a fixed release schedule for example and that we have a, a fixed time for for testing and and those things so that people know when the release will be available and until when they need to finish their the testings for example yeah i'm, I'm at a point uh, of yeah, a little bit confused um, because there are a huge number of users out there, mm -hmm. and of course they want a stable uh, distribution. Yeah. And every time I talk, when I talk to them, they say, "Hey, here's a bug over here, and there's a bug over here. You have to test it." And every time I answer, we are just a few men, uh, just a few people, and mm -hmm. out there are a lot of people. We can't test anything. And we certainly can't test all the things. When we put out a major release or a, a core update with a huge number of um, changes that we are not so sure about, we usually wait until we reach 1% in Fire Info. So the release is out there, we ask people to install it, and then we wait until like 1% of the people who send their profile installed it. So that we think that 1% is, yeah, has, has some sort of significance that, that is the, the break-even point where you can say, okay, if it works for 1% of the user, it works for everyone. Um, that's uh, what we're currently doing for, for bigger changes. For, for smaller things, well, we just do it ourselves, but I don't really think that software is tested if there are only one, two or five people even testing it. That's that's not the result or the the kind of stable software that I'm expecting. Maybe the the people out there don't know that the main work are done uh, by testing and not by the developing. So so, so if you if you develop yeah, something, um, you are the one who knows the code. You are the one uh, such a, a little bit client blind, function blind, maybe, and there must be. Uh, yeah. Other people who test it, who, which don't know the code, so they must understand what they uh, do there and what... Developers are usually living in their small little bubbles. So usually we say it's not our fault if something is not working. So um, we sometimes are a bit, a, pain of the, uh, well, a bit of a pain in the ass um, when it comes to bug reporting. Well, you have to, to open a proper report. That's what I, I demand from, from those people who test it. If, if you say just it doesn't work, that doesn't help me at all finding the bug. So um, what we do usually is we, we fix the problem and test it in our small environment but, um, to, to be sure that it is not breaking anything else. We need to test more environments because IPFI is very versatile and there are so many different environments where people use it and we can't create them all in the lab. Um, we also don't even think about um, most of the devices um, and that, that people use and the environments in which they, they use um, IPFI. So um, our, the bubble in, in that we are living is yeah kind of small and in fact, the, the actual world is, is really 
is, is much bigger. So um, testing is so important because that connects the big bubble with the small one. We just we we do theoretical changes. We change code and we implement features like they should work. Um, but in, in the real world, there are bugs. There is malfunctioning um, other software. There are um, just things that are not expected. For example, if we implement something uh, according to a standard, but people expect a, a completely different result, we should fix that. And probably. Um, so these are just things that need to be tested by other people. If the development, uh, deve if the developer is also the tester, th that doesn't really work. Not at all. So if I understand your words right, your, um, or your meaning is that the testing is almost... It's key. Yeah, it's important, um, um, almost imp uh, such important that uh, development itself. Even more, I think. Well, development is about creating mostly new features, but testing is about fixing bugs and make making features ready for for production use, for example. So, so every tester is uh, such a contributor of the project. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, the thing is, if I just use the yeah, I, I should have mentioned that uh, I I showed you the the numbers of commits and then then we ha we do have a rank which is not at all um, representing what people are actually contributing. It just says how many changes um, they made in the code and you can split up your changes into a huge number of smaller commits which I tend to do more often and other people tend to do slightly bigger commits where are uh, bigger changes. So um, that doesn't say anything about how active someone contributes, actively someone contributes to the project. Um, testing is yeah maybe another invisible thing. You, you can't see it. You are probably not mentioned in in the commit logs and you can't you're not in the, in the change log yeah there's there's not it's maybe not too exciting to to get yourself into this because you can't put your name on it you're just yeah doing doing stuff to make it better for all of us but you don't get um, too much of a, a reward for that yeah that's unfortunately like it is. If I understand this right, um, every user um, can be uh, or should be um, a tester as well. I think so, yeah. At least those people who are yeah, able of looking into um, yeah, the, the things that, that they are testing. So, for example, if I'm at an, um, an administrator in, in a company, for example, then I have some expertise in certain areas. So, if those pe people look um, into the, the features where they have the, the experience. Yeah, of course, th that would be very beneficial. But testing is also about yeah, reporting things that are not logical, why maybe the, the GUI does some thing that you didn't expect. And I think those are things that everybody can do. You don't need to be able to program or something like that. Everybody can simply do it just in, in different areas. So the actually, um, actual problem is um, you're not getting um, enough um, bug reports or enough uh, valuable bug reports. Yeah, so um, the thing is if, if things break because we made, made a mistake, people report those things. But you never get a report that, that, bug, uh, that, that co uh, release worked well for me. That's a thing that's completely missing out. And so we just have to assume that if maybe 1% of the users install the release, it must be okay for them. Mm. And yeah, if you're making guesses like that, you will sooner or later ship a release with a major bug and yeah, then you're a bit screwed. Maybe it would be a solution to, um, to make the process of bug reporting itself um, more easy. Yeah, we, we, we do have the bug tracker, which is for the actual bugs. So if, you, if you're sure that you found a bug, um, open a, a report on the, uh, on the bug, uh, on our bugzilla. Um, if you're not so sure, if you maybe think that this is something that may be only happening to you, that you're yeah, seeing some, some weird behavior or whatever, um, then you should open a post uh, on the forums and 
just describe your problem and maybe there are other people who are experiencing the, the same thing or maybe they take the time and yeah um, the same configuration apply it to their system and then they they see that they are running into the same bug that helps us actually a lot mm. so if we know that um, there is some some problem that is only um, uh, happening for one user we can't really be sure if that's a bug in our software or is the uh, if that is something else happening there um, if we have five bug reports or five reports of the same thing then we can be 100% sure that there must be something that we need to fix so then the number even if um, there is already a bug report about um, some problem if you just um, log in and type in I, I'm, I'm uh, experiencing the, the same problem that helps us a lot so I think it's easy to do. It's not another question, but maybe uh, finally words about this question. So um, there's uh, finally three steps or, or three kinds of uh, methods to um, to help the product. We, we, you can you say you, we can donate, we can uh, contribute some code, mm -hmm. and most of most important, of course, is testing it, yeah. testing it and help others uh, who have problems w w which don't, they don't might be able to describe them exactly so uh, help them at the forums uh, or at the bug tracker to um, find the really problem so really uh, bug or something like that or it's just a uh, problem of understanding something yeah that, that might happen and discussing that on the forums for example yeah that sorts out most of the bugs either if you're having just a configuration issue that that you made um, or if there is yeah, a rather complicated bug that, that helps very much. I have a question about the file info uh, counts. Didn't we have the, the download counts of the images so that we can compare them against the users in the file info system? Uh, we, we do have the, the download numbers. Um, surprisingly, China is download, downloading about 33%. Percent like one third of the downloads is going to China. We, we use AW st uh, stats for, for that. And um, according to the other statistics in uh, Fire Info, China is only at about 0.4%, I believe. So those don't really, uh, those numbers don't add up at all. I don't really know if there's something with uh, the Great Firewall of China, maybe. Um, we do, of course, know that um, some features of IPFire are um, forbidden to use or even to um, to have um, in, in certain countries. Toys, for example, mm. um, another thing. Um, but also the, the VPN features, for example, it's illegal to use them in, in some countries. Um, so maybe China is one of that and these things are blocked, but I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, yeah, if, if that's true. So, um, yeah, taking download numbers um, doesn't really help us um, to predict how many people are using um, the software. Um, there are also many runtime users, we think, um, who just download um, IPFire, try it out for a couple of days maybe, and then go back to, to the, the old system, for example. Um, other uh, on the other hand, you can burn a disk image and use it for a couple of, of installations. So if you're um, selling IPFire, for example, pre-installed on, on hardware appliances. So, yeah, I think these, thing might, uh, these things might even out uh, in the numbers at some time. Well, yeah, the, the China thing is pretty confusing, I think. And I'm not really sure if that are just some, some bots downloading our, our things over and over again. Well, it's pr pretty much spoils the entire statistics here. What would you say, were, where will be the Appify project in maybe in one or two years? What's <laughs> kind of expect? Yeah, I, I named this talk, look into the past and future, and actually it doesn't contain so much about the future because it's pretty much unpredictable. Um, we, we already talked about this yesterday. Um, for example, in at least 2010, I think sometimes earlier, we were 
kind of um, thinking or make we, we are making plans for IPv6 for example. Um, a feature that we thought would be huge by now and now it's 2014 there's literally no IPv6 deployment anywhere at least in, in Germany for, where we have access to uh, those internet connections and where we can can use uh, them to to develop those uh, those things that we need to properly support IPv6. Um, yeah, it's pretty rare. For example, um, we um, yeah had these kind of plans for other things as well. Dynastic, for example, is a bit disappointing because uh, yeah we took we we put much effort in it and. Um, only like two percent of the domains actually use DNS six, so and none of the the major players like Google uh, or Facebook, the the huge uh, websites in the um, Alexa top one hundred list is is using um, DNS six, for example. So predicting um, technical things is is very very complicated because you never know what you depend on and in in. In the case of the IPv6 thing, we depend on the internet service provider and uh, providers, and those people are, yeah, mentally ill. I think. <laughs> um, on the other hand, um, we can make some predictions about the the user base. For example, um, what we s are seeing now is that um, because there are more and more reports about. Um, security issues in the hardware routers that are sold by the internet service providers or given to you when you assign the, the contract for your DSL um, or cable. Um, those devices, they have serious security issues and the manufacturers, they don't really patch them very well. They only fix them if they must. There are some, some who do it a bit better, there are some who are really worse at um, are, are even worse at doing their job. Um, but I think that we can see that people are moving a bit away. There's also this this router swung thing that where the um, provider is able to um, force you to use the the router that they send you. Um, and yeah, we have been in touch with the Free Software Foundation Europe to work against that so people can choose IP Fire, for example and use that for the internet connection and um, that would be I think that um, I would say carries on in the, in the future that people move, um, move away from the, the default routers and they use for example solutions like IPFire um, because of various things. There are cheap and very small and tiny hardware appliances available now. Um, they don't consume much more, uh, they don't consume any more energy uh, than the, the average um, ISP router, or at least not significantly, and they're capable of doing many more things. Um, and the, the networks that we have in our homes and in our offices, they are getting more, more and more complex. The last big thing that moved into the IP network was voice over IP, for example. And um, in the past, if um, the internet connection cut out, you could still call someone. Today you can't because you are relying on your internet connection and so I think it's very very important that the internet connection is um, yeah, running 24-7, it's fast and yeah, you, you have um, for example um, very low latency. Those things are important right now and I think that the hardware routers can't always provide them. So um, if that's going on and if we see more home automation and whatever uh, the, the future might bring us. I think the, the part um, of the router and the firewall becomes more and more important and um, the hardware routers can't even cope with that right now. So hopefully that's a thing that we will see in the future. It would be interesting to, to uh, re-watch the video in a year or two and see what stupid assumptions we made.